Hello, in this video I'm going to introduce the ideas about the relationship between symmetry and groups, because the reason why groups are so powerful is their relationship to symmetry and their ability to describe symmetries, and that sees them used in many areas of physics, for example. And in this lesson we're going to look at the symmetry of an equilateral triangle, that's a triangle with three sides all the same. Or what do I mean when I say a symmetry of this triangle? Well, a symmetry of an object is a sort of transformation you can do on the object that leaves the object unchanged. So we put these labels on the vertices so that we know what we've done, because otherwise we would perform the transformation and we wouldn't be able to see what's actually happened to the triangle. So we label them A, B, and C. So what are the symmetries of an equilateral triangle? The first symmetry is a rotational symmetry, and it's a transformation that rotates the triangle anti-clockwise by 120 degrees. So let's list this in our list of symmetries. Then we can rotate the triangle 120 degrees more, and so the first symmetry is this anti-clockwise rotation by 120 degrees. Then we also have a symmetry that's rotation by 240 degrees, we're just rotating it once more by 120 degrees. And then we can rotate it another time by 120 degrees, but that's a 360 degree rotation, so we're going to end up in exactly the same place we started off with. And, and we do actually count this as a symmetry transformation, it's called the identity transformation, it's the transformation that actually does nothing to the shape. So even if you have a shape that's not symmetric in any way at all, you can say its symmetry group contains the identity transformation. We can perform a transformation on it that keeps the shape the same, if that transformation just does nothing to it. It sounds a bit like cheating, but there we go. So those are the three rotational symmetries of our triangle, or two rotational symmetries and the identity transformation. The other symmetries are called mirror symmetries, because the transformations are reflections in a line drawn on the paper, in exactly the same way that a mirror works. So, our first mirror symmetry is a reflection in the vertical line that goes through the top of the triangle at the point A. And what this symmetry is going to do is it's going to flip the bottom two corners so that now B becomes C and C becomes B. So this is also a symmetry. The corners have changed location, but the black triangle still remains the same shape. So it's a symmetry of the triangle. And if you'll notice that going anti-clockwise, the vertices of the triangle are labelled A, C and B. So the order of the labels has changed. Previously it was A, B and C, and now it's A, C and B. We have two more mirror symmetries. One is a reflection in a diagonal line that goes through B. And I'm calling this a positive diagonal line because the slope of it is positive. And you can see again that reflection in this line leads us to a triangle whose vertices in the anti-clockwise direction are labelled A, C and B. And finally, if we flip through the remaining axis, so that's the diagonal line going through the vertex C, which I've called the negative diagonal axis because it's sloping downwards. Again, you can see that the order of the labels of the vertices goes A, C and B. So, because the order is the same for any of these flips through the diagonal axis, A, C, B, we should be able to get from one flip to another just by rotation. So the flip through the positive axis could be a flip through the vertical axis followed by some sort of rotation and the same with the flip through the negative diagonal axis. Alright, so now we have a list of the six different transformations we've applied to this triangle, and this is a list of all the symmetries of the triangle. Now is when the group part of this lesson comes in. Let's give labels to these symmetries, and I'm just going to label them with letters that go from A to F, but in a slightly funny order, and there is some reason why I'm labelling them in this odd order. But in any case, the order isn't really important. All that matters is that I've given each of these transformations a symbol by which we can refer to it easily, and we're going to create a group out of these transformations. So the elements of the set that form our group are the transformations themselves, so each element in the set is a transformation. It's not a number, it's not a letter. The letter is standing in for the transformation that I'm doing on the triangle. So when I say the letter A, I mean a rotation anti-clockwise by 120 degrees. And the set that I'm going to collect these transformations in is called the dihedral set of order 3. Really what that means is just it's a set that characterises the symmetries of an equilateral triangle, and it's usually represented by a capital D with a subscript 3 next to it. So here's our set of D3, which contains the transformations from A to F. So now we have our set, but a group requires both a set and a binary operation. So what's our binary operation going to be? Well, I've already sort of mentioned it, because I said that a rotation anti-clockwise by 240 degrees can be thought of as a rotation anti-clockwise by 120 degrees, followed by another rotation anti-clockwise by 120 degrees. 
So the act of performing one transformation and then following it by another transformation is what we mean by our binary operation. Let's write it down. So we have C, which stands for rotation anticlockwise by 240 degrees, is going to be equal to the transformation A followed by, we're going to draw this hollow dot to represent followed by, A again. But can you see what we have here? We have two elements on the left of the equation combining in some way to form an element on the right hand side of the equation. And that's exactly what we want from a binary operation. So we've just discovered the binary operation this group is going to use. It's called composition, but really what it is is just perform one transformation and then perform the next transformation, where the first transformation I'm applying is the one on the right hand side of the dot, and the second transformation I'm applying is the one on the left hand side of the dot. And this binary operation is called composition. It's a composition of transformations. Now, we can continue to call a rotation anticlockwise by 240 degrees by the letter C, but we've just seen that that rotation can be represented by the transformation A followed by the same transformation A. So we're going to come up with a better symbol for C, and that is A squared. Now, this isn't the multiplication of A times A, because A is a transformation, it's not a number, and so it can't be multiplied. But a squared sort of is a way of remembering that the rotation anticlockwise by 240 degrees is made up of two rotations of 120 degrees. And this 240 degree rotation, a squared, is equal to the composition of a with a. So let's replace c with a squared. I'm not changing anything except the name by which I call this transformation. OK, now what happens if I try a third rotation by 120 degrees? Well, remember we're using a binary operation, and so we can only compose two elements of our set at a time. So we could do the first two first, and then the third transformation, or we could do the second and the third transformation first, and then the first transformation. Remember that the order of transformations is going from the right-hand side to the left-hand side, so when I say first, I mean the first transformation we apply to the triangle, which appears on the right-hand side of this expression. So if we compose the second and third transformations together, then we'll get a squared, which is a rotation by 240 degrees, composed with a, which is just going to rotate the triangle first by 120 degrees, and then it's going to rotate the triangle by 240 degrees. So when we perform those two rotations one after another, we're going to end up rotating the triangle by 360 degrees, which brings the triangle exactly back to where it was before, including the labels that we've made up for the vertices. So this transformation is really doing nothing at all. And we could follow suit with what we did last time. We could call this a cubed because we've got a squared composed with a. But actually, this transformation, which is called the identity transformation, the transformation which does nothing at all, is usually represented by the letter e. That's why I wrote it in that order. And so we're going to continue to use the letter e to represent this transformation that does nothing. Next, we have the letter b representing the flip in the vertical axis. And as we noted before, with the rotations, the order of the labels on the vertices always goes a, b, c in the anti-clockwise direction. But when we make a flip in any axis, then the order of those labels goes a, c, b in the anti-clockwise direction. And so there's no way we can compose rotations together so that we produce what looks like a flip in the vertical axis. So I'm happy just to call the flip in the vertical axis b. We can't think of a better label for that transformation than b itself. But what about the flip in the positive diagonal and negative diagonal axes? That's D and F. Well, remember that I said that all of them produce the same order of labels in the anti-clockwise direction, A, C, and B. And so it should be that we can produce one by flipping in the vertical axis and then rotating the triangles by some amount. So let's see how we can do that. For D, which is the flip in the positive diagonal axis, C and A are going to exchange places. So we're going to have A in the bottom right, C at the top, and b at the bottom left. And how can we produce the same transformation using only the transformations we've looked at before, the flip in the vertical axis and the rotations? If we flip in the vertical axis, we're going to get a on the top, c on the left, and b on the right. But we want, we want a in the bottom right. So we're going to have to rotate the triangle twice, that's by 240 degrees, after we've made the flip, in order to get the same transformation as a flip in the positive diagonal axis. But we can do that with the binary operation of composition. First, we do the flip in the vertical axis, that's b, and then we compose it with the rotation anticlockwise by 240 degrees, that's a squared. And so because d can be written in this way as a composition of a squared and b, 
Then, in exactly the same way as we came up with a symbol for a squared, we're going to come up with a symbol for d that reminds us of that fact. So we're going to call d from now on a squared b. And for f, well, f is the transformation that leaves c in the same place but flips the labels b and a. So a is now on the bottom left. Well, you can see that this is just the same as flipping in the vertical axis where a remains on top and then rotating anti-clockwise by 120 degrees, just one rotation. So A moves from the top to the bottom left, C moves from the bottom left to the bottom right, and B moves from the bottom right to the top. And so F is just the composition of A with B. B goes first, the flip in the vertical axis goes first, and then A goes second, the rotation by 120 degrees goes second. And so now we represent F to remind ourselves again this isn't anything special, this is just a change in the symbol, or a change in the notation we're using to represent the transformation f, which is a flip in this negative diagonal axis, we're going to call f a b. We've discussed what the symmetries are, and then we've given them names, and then we've had to think about it, and we've said that, well actually some of these symmetry transformations can be produced using combinations of other symmetry transformations. And we used what we discovered in performing composition to relabel the symmetry transformations into something that made more sense to us. So now we have our set, D3, and we have our binary operation, composition. But that's not it. That's not all we have to do. In order to check whether these two together really form a group, there are still four conditions to check before we can say that this pair, the set and the binary operation, are a group. Those are closure, associativity, identity, and inverse. But we'll leave that for the next video.